It's good to be with you. I want to thank you all for inviting me to speak with you today about the future of Iran. Right now, the United States is at a critical juncture in our relationship with Iran. Five years ago, President Obama entered the United States into a nuclear agreement with Iran that gave the Iranian regime the resources to wreak enormous havoc across the region. As you know far too well, the catastrophic Obama-Iran nuclear deal reconnected Iran to the global financial system while also flooding the ayatollahs with hundreds of billions of dollars in sanctions relief, gifting them everything they needed to launder vast sums of money across the world for terrorism and proliferation. This included $1.7 billion in unmarked cash to the Ayatollah, which helped fund attacks against U.S. military bases as a part of a ransom for hostages, because the Obama administration knew how it would look if they implemented the deal with at least some of the hostages being released. I urged President Trump to withdraw from this disastrous deal. Within the Trump administration, there was a major battle. Both the State and Defense Department opposed pulling out of the deal. And yet, two years ago, President Trump agreed with me, and he pulled out of the deal. I think that's the single most important foreign policy decision that has been made in the entire Trump administration. After that, again, as you know far too well, work still remained to be done. After we pulled out of the deal, there were still a whole series of waivers in place, keeping much of the deal still alive. The most important of these was the oil waiver. We had a waiver in place that allowed Iran to sell about a million barrels a day of oil, primarily to China and India. And that was the principal source of revenue for the Ayatollah and for his funding of terrorism against America. Once again, there was a battle within the Trump administration about whether to end the oil waiver. The State Department argued, no, don't end the oil waivers. It'll cause the global price of oil to skyrocket. The Department of Energy, on the other hand, to their credit, took the other side. And they said, yes, absolutely end it. There's plenty of oil supply in the world. It's not going to cause prices to skyrocket. I engaged both the State Department and the Department of Energy publicly and even more vigorously in private, and made the case to the president directly, we should end the oil waiver. The president agreed. In the end, we now know that state was wrong and energy was right. Oil prices didn't skyrocket. And so what state was saying was demonstrably false. Then there were the civilian nuclear waivers. At places like Iran's Fordo facility, which was dug into the side of a mountain specifically for the purpose of building nuclear weapons to attack the United States of America, we were allowing continued international cooperation. I was proud to lead bicameral calls in Congress with Lindsey Graham and Liz Cheney. Together, we introduced legislation to revoke the civil nuclear waivers that the administration had been granting which allowed Iran to continue building up its nuclear program. In May of this year, after enormous battles internally within the administration, President Trump once again did the right thing and ended the civil nuclear waivers for Iran, which was a big step in the right direction. Now it's time for the United States to finally and irreversibly end what remains of the disastrous deal and the benefits that Iran gets from it by invoking the sanctions snapback described in the deal's United Nations resolution. Unless we do so, the UN's arms embargo, the ballistic missile bans will inevitably expire, allowing Russia and China to start selling billions of dollars of weapons to Iran. Toward that end, I'm leading the push right now to get the administration to go to the UN and to invoke the snapback in UN Security Council Resolution 2231. We don't need anyone else's permission to use this mechanism. We can go there tomorrow and begin the process, which will finally shred the disastrous Obama-Iran nuclear deal 
once and for all. Of course, the challenges posed by Iran go far beyond the nuclear issue. The Iran regime's malign activities are well known. Missile proliferation, seeking destruction of America and our allies, including Israel, creating terror states within states in Iraq, in Yemen, in Lebanon, floating the Assad regime in Syria, funding and directing terrorism across the globe, and of course, inside Iran, over and over again, unthinkable human rights atrocities. Part of the response to these activities involved tearing up the nuclear deal, the right thing to do, because the nuclear deal forced us to give up our most powerful sanctions against these behaviors. And the Trump administration has taken significant and meaningful steps to reverse course and to impose maximum pressure on Iran and to diplomatically isolate Iran, including taking out Soleimani, a designated terrorist responsible for the deaths of at least 603 United States servicemen and women. We must do more. When we're talking about the future of Iran, it is my belief that we need to collapse the regime. You know, this used to be a, a, a straightforward and, and broadly accepted idea. The Iranian regime unremittingly seeks our destruction, death to America, the Ayatollah chants, and we will not be safe until it's gone. Somehow in recent years, particularly as a fallout from the Obama-Iran deal, that became viewed as, as a radical idea because it was seen as synonymous with regime change followed by endless nation building of the sort that we have needlessly, foolishly, and catastrophically pursued in Iraq. But of course, that's not what it necessarily means. Some people think that guns or tanks or missiles are the only things that matter. But truth has the power to transform the world. And we have the tools alongside the power of truth that stop far short of war from bolstering our allies to economic pressure. It wouldn't be the first time we'd applied such a strategy to a regime that sought our destruction. In my Senate office in Washington, I have three busts, a bust of Winston Churchill, a bust of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and a bust of Ronald Reagan. And the reason for that is that I think all three understood the power of speaking truth, the power of words and clarity of vision. Yes, Churchill commanded an army, but Churchill's real lasting impact came through the words and vision that roused the world to defend freedom. I have a bust of Ronald Reagan in my office because he demonstrated that truth is powerful and it can transform the world. Also in my office is a gigantic painting of Reagan standing before the Brandenburg Gate, saying the words, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I think those are the most important words uttered by any leader in modern times. Some years ago, I was in Jerusalem where I had the opportunity to visit with Natan Sharansky, the famed Soviet dissident. And Sharansky told me about how when he was in the depths of the Russian gulag, the prisoners would pass from cell to cell notes. Did you hear what President Reagan said? Evil empire, ash heap of history, tear down this wall. As important as those words were, a whole lot of people don't know the backstory behind President Reagan standing before the Brandenburg Gate. Three times, the State Department edited those words, tear down this wall, out of the speech. And three times, Reagan, with his own hand, wrote them back. And they proceeded to have arguments where the State Department said, Mr. President, you can't say this. Mr. President, this is, this is too belligerent. This is unrealistic. We all know the Berlin Wall will stand for all eternity, so you simply can't say something like this. And each time, Reagan wrote it back with a smile and said, you don't understand. This is the whole point of the speech. And just a few years after those historic words were declared, 
the Berlin Wall was torn to the ground. That's important to reflect on. You know, our high school history classes, our college history classes don't teach it. But the United States didn't bomb the Berlin Wall. We didn't send in tanks to demolish it. It was simply the power of words, the power of truth, the power of sunshine, the power of light. Tyranny's fear, truth and light. That's something America should remember. That our principles, that truth, that freedom can tear down walls, can topple tyrannies, can promote liberty. Our options in foreign policy aren't simply sending in the Marines or doing nothing, but rather the United States should consistently be a voice for freedom. We should be a voice for human rights. We should be a voice for democracy because truth is powerful and it can transform the world. This is also where our strategy with Iran comes into play. Just as Ronald Reagan brought down the Soviet Union with strategic strength and by boldly speaking the truth, we likewise must work to collapse the Iranian regime that oppresses its people and seeks to sow terror all over the world. I know this is possible. And not only that, it's necessary. Please know that I'm working tirelessly with my colleagues in Congress to hold the Iranian regime accountable for working to develop nuclear weapons. Maximum pressure should mean maximum pressure. We must continue to vocally and unapologetically stand up to the evil Iranian regime. And we must exert maximum pressure and not allow the Ayatollahs to build a nuclear program. That, I believe, is the only reasonable path forward. In closing, I want to thank you all at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies for hosting this important event today and for your tireless efforts to hold the Iranian regime accountable. I also want to thank you again for the excellent research and the analysis y'all do to strengthen our national security and to mitigate threats to the United States from hostile nations all over the world. Your work is important. It makes a difference. And I'm proud to stand with you. Thank you, and God bless you.